So today we're going to be start, uh, reading from February 2021, lessons three and four, which include chapter three, Pure Devotional Service, The Change in Heart, texts one through 18. Just as a little bit of a introduction to this chapter and how it fits into the structure of what we're studying. The living entity has desires and its innermost desire is reciprocated with by the Supreme Lord in various forms, infinite forms in fact. But some souls as we know don't have a spontaneous attraction for their service to the Lord, which is their constitutional position. And thus the material world is a creation to rectify that tendency. Just like the prison house is called the house of correction. It's a place where people who are not able to live in society and follow its rules and norms uh, are placed in order to hopefully correct them. And of course the material world is the place designed for that by the Supreme Lord. At the very beginning of creation, Lord Krishna, in order to help instruct and give a path for the various living entities, how to uh, correct that tendency, instructed the firstborn living being, Brahma, about this Srimad Bhagavatam. And he did it in a condensed form, only a few verses, but it's just like a seed that contains a whole tree. Everything is within those verses. Then the Lord explained to Brahma, you please expand on this and instruct uh, the living entities as I've instructed you. Brahma instructed his son Narada. Narada instructed his disciple Vyasadeva. Vyasadeva expanded it, wrote down the Srimad Bhagavatam and taught it to his son, Sukadeva Goswami. And of course, we know that now he's speaking this same information to Maharaj Parikit at his time of death. However, this ultimate story is being spoken by someone who was at that gathering, Sutta Goswami, and he's with the sages at Namasharanya speaking this same Srimad Bhagavatam. And naturally through the disciplic succession, the same information of how the living entities can um, adjust is being described by Sukadev Goswami in this particular chapter to, Sukadev, to Maharaj Prickett. And it's a very methodical curriculum, how step by step, the living entity can actually change its innermost desires. It's not just a conscious or intellectual exercise. It's actually um, much, much deeper than that, much bigger than that due to the living entity's eternal nature and unlimited nature in a sense, because it is eternal. Um, in order to reach down to the depths of the heart, uh, the, the, the desires of the living entity, just like, like we learned in a previous uh, section, that when someone leaves their body with material desires, they're carried by their materially molded mind and senses to a new body. But what's being described here by Sukadev Goswami is how to become completely freed from that tendency by developing a natural attraction for the Lord. So that's what we'll be reading now. I'm gonna put on my uh, share screen so we can see just what's going on. So can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yes. Chapter three, pure devotional service, the change in heart. And this is what we're, this is what Sukadeva Goswami is describing. So as we read this chapter, if we try to 
pierce into and see and understand what he's saying and why he's saying it, then we can understand why this chapter is called Pure Devotional Service, A Change in Heart. So I'll read the first verse and purport, and then Samapriya, as she's done last week, uh, will organize our different speakers. Okay, uh, Vaishnavi, you, you can speak after. Okay, ma'am. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, third chapter, text one. Sri Sukadev Goswami said, Maharaj Parikit, as you have inquired from me as to the duty of the intelligent man who is on the threshold of death, so I have answered you. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. In human society all over the world, there are millions and billions of men and women, and almost all of them are less intelligent because they have very little knowledge of spirit soul. Almost all of them have a wrong conception of life, for they identify themselves with the gross and subtle material bodies, which they are not, in fact. They may be situated in different high and low positions in the estimation of human society, but one should know definitely that unless one inquires about his own self beyond the body and the mind, all his activities in human life are total failures. Therefore, out of thousands and thousands of men, one may inquire about his spirit self and thus consult the revealed scriptures like Vedanta Sutras, Bhagavad Gita, and Srimad Bhagavatam. But in spite of reading and hearing such scriptures, unless one is in touch with a realized spiritual master, he cannot actually realize the real nature of self, etc. Therefore, manisinam, meaning thoughtful, is particularly used here. A manisinam person, like Maharaj Parikit, must therefore take to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and fully engage himself in devotional service, hearing, chanting, etc., of the holy names and pastimes of the Lord, which are all Hari Katamrita. This action is especially recommended when one is preparing for death. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.3.2 through 7. One who desires to be absorbed in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti effulgence should worship the master of the Vedas, Lord Brahma or Brahaspati, the learned priest. One who desires powerful sex should worship the heavenly king Indra, and one who desires good progeny should worship the great progenitors called the Prajapatis. One who desires good fortune should worship Durga Devi, the superintendent of the material world. One desiring to be very powerful should worship fire, and one who aspires only after money should worship the Vasus. One should worship the Rudra incarnations of Lord Shiva if he wants to be a great hero. One who wants a large stock of grains should worship Aditi. One who desires to attain the heavenly planets should worship the sons of Aditi. One who desires a worldly kingdom should worship Vishwadeva. And one who wants to be popular with the general mass of population should worship the Sadhya demigod. One who desires a long span of life should worship the demigods known as Ashwini Kumaras. And a person desiring a strong built body should worship the earth. One who desires stability in the post should worship the horizon and the earth combined. One who desires to be beautiful should worship the beautiful residence of the Gandharva planet. And one who desires a good wife should worship the Apsaras and the Urvasi society girls of the heavenly kingdom. One who desires domination over others should worship Lord Brahma 
the head of the universe. One who desires tangible fame should worship the personality of Godhead. And one who desires a good bank balance should worship the demigod Varuna. If one desires to be a greatly learned man, he should worship Lord Shiva. And if one desires a good marital relation, he should worship the chaste goddess Uma, the wife of Lord Shiva. Thank you, um, thank you, Vaishnavi. Before we go on with Pritam, if you could read next, and then Karna. But um, it's very. This is a very interesting verse where we see everything that is desirable in this material world. There's a method to uh, uh, to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Why would that be heard by Mars Prickett seven days before he's going to leave? So this is getting really more and more interesting. Okay, so Makadasi then Pritam. Unmute yourself. Who is reading first, me? Akadasi. Okay. okay. Oh, me. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, right. Report. There are different modes of worship for different persons desiring success in particular subjects. The conditioned soul living in the purview of the material world cannot be an expert in every type of materially enjoyable asset. But one of uh, but one can have considerable influence over a particular matter by worshiping a particular demigod as mentioned above. Ravana was made a very powerful man by worshiping Lord Shiva. And he used, and he used to offer severed heads to please Lord Shiva. He became so powerful by the grace of Lord Shiva that all the demigods were afraid of him until he at last challenged the personality of Godhead, Sri Ramchandra, and thus ruined himself. In other words, all such persons who aspire after gaining some or all of the material objects of enjoyment or the gross materialistic persons are on the whole less intelligent. As confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 720. I'll stop there just for a second, Akadasi. Anybody know 720? Okay, go ahead, Kadasi. No, so you have to say it. <laughs> I gotta look it up. Yanti Deva Vrata Devan. Oh, thank you. Sukla, Sulakshana knew it. Okay. Um, oh, it is said there that those who are bereft of all good sense or those whose intelligence is withdrawn by the deluding energy of Maya aspire to achieve all sorts of material enjoyment in life by pleasing the various demigods or by advancing in material civilization under the heading of scientific progress. The real problem of life in the material world is to solve the question of birth, death, old age, and disease. Death is inevitable for everyone intelligent or foolish. But Pariksit Maharaj has been addressed by the Swami as the Manishi or the man of highly developed mind. Because at the time of death, he left all material enjoyment and completely surrendered unto the lotus feet of the Lord by hearing his messages from the right person, Shukadev Goswami. But, but aspirations for material enjoyment by endeavoring persons are condemned. Such aspirations are something like the intoxication of a degraded human society. Intelligent persons should try to avoid these aspirations and seek instead the permanent life by returning home back to Godhead. Okay, so we're gonna see Srila Prabhupada diffuse, completely diffuse these desires for material opulences. So Pritam, go on, please. Uh, just one second. Uh, one of the things that I that that jumped out at me in this particular section is that Sukadev Goswami listed so many of the different demigods. And today, of course, we know in modern society 
that when someone thinks of the Hindu religion, Hindu culture, they think there are many, many gods, that it's pantheistic, that there are so many different gods. And Srila Prabhupada points out in this chapter that if one hears from a bona fide disciplic succession, that's the way to properly understand the Vedas. If we don't follow that system, then it's confusing. And we see that practically. Because what happens is they, they take this one, this one set of verses, two through seven, say Sukadeva Goswami spoke this to Maharaj Parikit explaining how to do the worship. But if you follow through the chapter, then we'll see further what Sukadeva is actually saying and why he's saying it. He's not explaining that you should worship these different demigods. But if you take that one verse or those section of verses in context, that that's all he's saying, then you completely misunderstand uh, the real message. Arna, did you have a question, Dolly? Uh, yes, or a comment, but you can um, answer. Modern men are so unfortunate that they try hard for all those opulences that Prophet just mentioned, but they don't know the trick about, you know, worshiping a demigod. At least that's more pious than the devious methods they use to get ahead. That's impersonalism. I think oh, it's yeah right. It's more pious than whatever devious means they might use, though. Yeah, can I say something? Sure. In the in the worship of the demigods, it's it's encouraged a surprising amount in the Puranas, and uh, various demigods are even exalted as the supreme. But the idea is that the conditioned soul is so addicted to sense gratification, they'll follow that advice and unwittingly worship Vishnu. So every single time you worship a demigod, it starts with Om and mantras to worship Vishnu, which gradually, lifetime after lifetime, purifies the conditioned soul and makes them eventually attracted to why am I worshiping these demigods if I have to approach Vishnu anyway? Very nice. Good trick. <laughs> okay, Pritam and okay. then Karana. Okay. I think we read, read this, Prabhu, already. Okay. Uh, text 238, one should worship Lord Vishnu or his devotee for spiritual advancement in knowledge and for protection of heredity and advancement of a dynasty, one should worship the various demigods. Purport, the path of religion entails making progress on the path of spiritual advancement, ultimately reviving the eternal relation with Lord Vishnu in his impersonal effulgence his localized Paramatma feature and ultimately his personal feature by spiritual advancement in knowledge. And one who wants to establish a good dynasty and be happy in the progress of temporary bodily relations should take shelter of the Pitas and the demigods in other pious planets. Such different classes of worshippers of different demigods may ultimately reach the respective planets of those demigods within the universe but he who reaches the spiritual planet in the Brahma Jyoti achieves the highest perfection. This, this verse particularly really popped out at me. You see both are there. Worship the demigods for your, uh, fulfilling your material desires, but those who are more intelligent worship Krishna. I thought that was really sweet. Okay, so Karana and then Maitreya, could you read after Karana, please? I think Sankarsana... Um, I looked up 720, and it's Kamaistar Swaya. Those whose intelligence have been, have been stolen by material desires, surrender to demigods, and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. That's uh, uh, what, what was the Sanskrit at the beginning again? Kamaistar Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is all what Prabhupada is saying right here in the purports. This is, the, this, is, this is his ammunition. Krishna himself is saying that it's less intelligent to worship the demigods because worshiping, even though you're right, Maitreya, this was, it is a trick of Krishna to get everyone to ultimately worship Krishna. But uh, this, the desire for, for material uh, enjoyment takes a soul further and further away from Krishna. So the two are being stated very, very clearly. If you want Krishna, if you want reality, if you want the truth, then you have to give up these things in the material world. 
And Prabhupada's very, very strong about this. So Karna, please read, and then Maitreya. Okay. One who, um, one who desires domination over a kingdom or an empire should worship the Manus. One who desires victory over an enemy should worship the demons. And one who desires sense gratification should worship the moon. But one who desires nothing of material enjoyment should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Report. For a liberated person, all the enjoyments listed above are considered to be absolutely useless. Only those who are conditioned by the material modes of external energy are captivated by different types of material enjoyment. In other words, the transcendentalist has no material desires to be fulfilled, whereas the materialist has all types of desires to be fulfilled. The Lord has proclaimed that the materialist who desires material enjoyment and thus seek favor of different demigods as mentioned above are not in control of their senses and so give themselves to not sense. One should therefore not desire any sort of material enjoyment being sensible enough to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Maitreya, thank you, Karna. Okay. It is clearly, is clearly defined herein that persons impregnated with different desires have different modes of worship. But one who has no desire for material enjoyment should worship the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, the Personality of Godhead. And this worshiping process is called devotional service. Pure devotional service means service to the Lord without any tinge of material desires, including desire for freedom of activity and empiric speculation. For fulfillment of material desires, one may worship the Supreme Lord, but the result of such worship is different as will be explained in the next verse. Generally, the Lord does not fulfill anyone's material desires for sense enjoyment but he awards such benedictions to worshipers of the Lord where they ultimately come to the point of not desiring material enjoyment. The conclusion is that one must minimize the desires for material enjoyment. And for this, one should worship the Supreme Personality of God, who is described herein as param or beyond anything material. Can you, can you explain that one line there that the Lord does not um, fulfill the desires generally of the living entities, but for his devotees, he does? What does that him, himself says that if a material, if a devotee who's sincere prays to me for material things, I do not grant him those things which will hurt him. That's a devotee who's on the who's on the threshold, though. You know, if we say that the, the Lord's fulfillment of his mercy is harishe tadbaramshanai, he takes away everything from his devotee. The purport Prophet isn't a miserable person his, being abandoned by his relatives and others because now he has no means. In that state, he's now has to become fully dependent on Krishna. So for the living entity who's on that threshold, Krishna will take everything away. But many living entities are not at that point. And if that happens to them, they would simply become haters of the Supreme. So for them, there's this other Vedic process. Thank you. Bajra, um, could you read? And then, I'm I, sorry. I, I had a question. I uh, want to hear a, a comment, maybe by Narayan Naren. I saw that he came today. Um, it says here that the conclusion is that one must minimize the desire for material enjoyment. And for this, one should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But we see that, practically speaking, a lot of people want to worship God, even worship Krishna, devotees, and at the same time, enjoy the material world. So what is the, what, what, why, 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 why one, why must one minimize their material enjoyment. I would say, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I would say material enjoyment does not lead to the final goal, which is to be God realized and to be to enjoy the effects of our life, to get to Krishna Loka, let's say. Following all these material enjoyments would not lead you to that destination. Very good, so it's a waste of time, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> well, we even, have- Even, even we, detrimental. We all have, material, we all have material needs while we exist in this earth. 
So we have to have food, shelter, clothing, etc. But the ultimate goal of all these material enjoyments would not lead us to the desired des destination. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. You. Nice to see you. Same here. Vajra, could you read please and then Tisha? Vajra Ji? Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Text and translation. A person who has broader intelligence, whether he be full of all material desire, without any material desire, or desiring liberation, must by all means worship the supreme whole, the personality of Godhead. Can you do the Sanskrit also, Bhadra Prabhu? Uh huh. Akama Sarva Kamova, Moksha Kam Udaridi, Tivirena Bhakti Yogena, Yajete Purusham Param. Oh, I'm Oh, sorry. Uh, not from the purport. I have to look at it in my book. A karma is one who has no material desire. A living being, naturally being the part and parcel of Supreme, whole Purusham Puram, who Purusham Purna has an, his natural function to serve the Supreme Being, just as the parts and parcel of the body or the limbs of the body are naturally meant to serve the complete body. Desireless mean, therefore, not to be inert like the stone, but to be conscious of the one sexual position and thus desire satisfaction only from the Supreme Lord. Srila Jogo Swami has explained this desirelessness as bhajaniya param purusha sukha matra sva sukha, sukhatvam uh, Sukhatvam in his Sandarbha. This means that one should feel happy only by experiencing the happiness of the Supreme Lord. This intuition of the living being is sometimes manifested even during the conditioned stage of a living being in the material world. And such, such institution is expressed in the manner of altruism, philanthropy, socialism, communism, etc by the undeveloped minds of less intelligent person. In the mundane fields, such as such an outlook of doing good to others in the form of society, community, family, country, and humanity is a partial manifestation of the same original feeling in which a pure living entity feels happiness by the happiness of the Supreme Lord. Such super feelings were exhibited by the damsels of Rajguni for the happiness of the Lord. The gopis loved the Lord without any return. And this is the perfect exhibition of the Akama spirit. Kama spirit or the desire for one's own satisfaction is fully exhibited in the material world. Whereas the spirit of Akama is fully exhibited in the spiritual world. So this, so this basically is explaining what? Can you... Can you help us understand that further? Can anyone help us to understand how that really, the, the feeling of satisfaction by being altruistic and uh, philanthropic and helping others in this world, that's part of Krishna's energy, but the proper use of it would be to see his satisfaction. Pati, can you explain that a little bit? Sure, it's a natural, it's a natural, constitutional position of the living entity to serve the Supreme Lord. Srila Prabhupada gave in the purport the example of the parts of the body. We've all heard this, this example. If all of the party, if all of the parts of the body work together to serve the stomach, they, they, then, then when the stomach receives the food, the whole body becomes satisfied. Similarly, watering the, watering the root of the, of the tree. We don't have to go to each leaf or branch. Simply by watering the root, all the branches are satisfied. But that natural tendency becomes perverted. It becomes deflected. It becomes filtered through the modes of material nature and exhibits itself in a different form, just like a pure white light when it goes through a filter of red or green or blue or purple. 
then when it reaches its destination, say the stage of a theater, then the light has become different. It's no longer white, it's purple, green, red, or blue. So the same thing happens. It's the natural tendency of the living entity being expressed through the body and the modes of material nature, but it's the natural tendency. So Srila Prabhupada's pointing out here that that natural tendency has to be corrected. It's, it's less intelligent to act that way. It's, it will only bring partial and temporary happiness, which won't satisfy the soul. Or so the, so, yeah. some, sometimes we think that, that these altruistic and mode of goodness um, activities are spiritual. You know, it's not that we shouldn't behave in a, a way that is um, uh, beneficial to all human beings or, and all living entities, but the main purpose has to be in serving the Supreme Personality of God. Per perhaps, perhaps we can go back to the very first question of the sages at Namasharanya. Faye, do you remember that first question that the sages asked Sutta Goswami when they first met? We studied this last year. I have to unmute. If not, maybe Sulakshana, Pritam, somebody who studied that with us, the first question asked by the sages. What is the ultimate good for humanity? Very good. What, mm -hmm. what is that which the general public, which everybody can do, which will lead them to the ultimate, the Shreyas, the ultimate goal? What is the ultimate good for the people in general? That's the first question of Srimad Bhagavatam. So Samapriya brought that up, that the ulti it, it may appear good, but the real good is to serve the Lord. Thank you. Tisha, could you please read? And then Radha and Nanda. Thoughts or can also be exhibitions of Kama spirit if they are desires for one's own satisfaction to be free from the material miseries. A pure devotee does not want liberation so that he may be relieved from the miseries of life. Even without so-called liberation, a pure devotee is aspirant for the satisfaction influenced by the Kama spirit, Arjuna declined to fight in the Kurukshetra battlefield <clears throat> because he wanted to save his relatives for his own satisfaction. But being a pure devotee, he agreed to fight on the instruction of the Lord because he came to his senses and realized that satisfaction to the Lord at the cost of his own satisfaction was his primary duty. Thus, he became a Kama. That is the perfect stage of a perfect living being. So this is, Prabhupada is absolutely describing the thing that we were discussing. Thank you. So Radha and then Nanda, please, could you read? Udara, okay. Udara D means one who has a broader outlook. People with desires for material enjoyment worship small demigods and such intelligence is condemned in the Bhagavad Gita 720 as Rita Jnana, the intelligence of one who has lost his senses. One cannot obtain any result from demigods without getting sanction from the Supreme Lord. Therefore, a person with a broader outlook can see that the ultimate authority is the Lord, even for material benefits. Under the circumstances, one with a broader outlook, even with the desire for material enjoyment or for liberation, should take to the worship of the Lord directly. And everyone, whether an Akama or Sakama or Moksha Kama, should worship the Lord with great expedience. This implies that Bhakti Yoga may be perfectly administered without any mixture of karma and jnana. As the unmixed sun ray is very forceful and is therefore called Tivra, similarly unmixed Bhakti Yoga of hearing, chanting, etc. may be performed by one and all regardless of inner motive. Thank you. Hachi, you have something to add to that? Uh, well, Srila Prabhupada's finishing up the, that particular purport by explaining that bhakti yoga, even if it sometimes um, the question may be asked, 
And I know people that have asked it. I, I'm, I'm so fallen. I'm so full of material desires that I can't approach Krishna. I don't want to worship him for anything material. And actually, they throw the baby out with the bathwater and stop worshiping and go and just fulfill their, their material desires. That kind of mentality is being uh, negated in this particular verse by Sukadev Goswami. No matter what one desires, it will become purified by association with the Supreme Lord and worshiping him. Thank you. Nanda, would you read and then Shankar Shan? Sure. All the different kinds of, this is a um, uh, third chapter, text number 11. All the different kinds of worshipers of multi demigods can attain the highest perfectional benediction, which is spontaneous attraction unflinchingly fixed on the Supreme Personality of Godhead only by the association of the pure devotees of the Lord. Hmm. So notes from the purport, the living entity in his pure state is conscious of the fact that he is part and parcel of the Lord. But when he is thrown into the material world on account of his desires to lord it over material energy, he becomes conditioned by the three modes of material nature and thus struggles for existence for the, for the highest benefit. And mm. that, huh. This struggle for existence is something like following the will of the wisp under the spell of material enjoyment. All plans for material enjoyment, either by worship of different demigods as described in the previous verses of this chapter, or by modernized advancement of scientific knowledge without the help of God or demigod, are illusory only. For despite all such plans for happiness, the conditioned living being within the compass of material creation can never solve the problems of life namely birth, death, old age, and disease. The history of the universe is full of such plan makers and many kings and emperors come and go leaving a plan making story only. But the prime problems of life remain unsolved despite all such endeavors by all endeavors by such plan makers. So tell us something about that. What really strikes you is that sentence where he says that um, the history of the universe is full of such plan makers and they come and they go and they leave a plan making story only. Yep, that's it, where you just <laughs> a plan making story only. It's so, it's so amazing. And still we don't make the connection, you know, that this person failed, the other one failed, and this one failed, and even if they were successful they still fail because they don't bring it with them, whatever they, whatever they have achieved. Anyway. Very nice. Thank you. I think Bhadra Prabhu has a question. Okay, Bhadra, can you, and then after Bhadra's question, Shankar uh, Sun, please read. Uh, I don't have a question, but if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, if you worship the person, worshiping the demigods, and getting some benefits is okay. Okay in a sense that you will get the benefit, but that is it. You worship, you get it, and you are done with it. There is no connection with the demigod, but with the Supreme Personality of God, and even you worship just for the material desire, that is the connection started for your spiritual life, even though you go, even though you go with the material desire. Very good, Raja. Yeah, good point. That's, that's very good, thank you. Shankar Shan? Yeah, I, I have a comment first. I think that the answer to the first Srimad Bhagavatam question, what was brought up was uh, you know, in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 2, 13, I got the verse that says, Oh, best among the twice born. It is therefore concluded that the highest perfection all can achieve by discharging the duties prescribed for one's own occupation according to caste divisions and orders of life is to please the personality of Godhead. And that some severe heart atrocious, um, uh, Bruce. I think that was the answer to that one. Okay. Thank you. There's a few answers. Are, uh, Sankar Shan, were you saying that that's the, the answer to the to the first I question? That's the an, to the I first that's question. The answer. I believe that's the answer. What's the Sanskrit in that one? Uh, you know, I know the last word. You know, uh, some severe heart atrocious. The last line. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, Yato bhakti ad hok saje ahaitu kia patihata yenatma supersidati. The supreme occupational duty for the living entity is to worship the transcendent Lord. Such devotional service must be uninterrupted uh, by anything material, and that will satisfy the soul. I think both of those are, are um, the ones that are used as the answer to that first question. What is the greatest thing that someone can do? Thank you. Shankar you want to continue reading? Okay. We also have information from the Bhagavad Gita that all the planets within the material world, including Brahma Loka, are but temporarily situated. And after a fixed period, they are all annihilated. Therefore, the demigods and their followers are all annihilated at the period of devastation. But one who reaches the kingdom of God gets their permanent share in eternal life. That is the verdict of Vedic literature. The worshippers of the demigods have one facility more than the unbelievers due to, their, due to their being convinced of the Vedic version by which they can get information of the benefit of worshiping the Supreme Lord and the association of the devotees of the Lord. The gross materialist, however, without any faith in the Vedic version remains eternally in darkness driven by a false conviction on the basis of imperfect experimental knowledge or so-called material science, which can, which can never reach into the realm of transcendental knowledge. So this is exactly what Karana, Karana said and Maitreya. You both had a nail on, head on the nail. Dandakesh, could you read please? You have to unmute. Continued. Therefore, unless the gross materialists or the worshippers of the temporary demigods come in contact with a transcendentalist, like the pure devotee of the Lord, their attempts are simply a waste of energy. Only by the grace of the divine personalities, the pure devotees of the Lord, can one achieve pure devotion which is the highest perfection of human life. Only a pure devotee of the Lord can show one the right way of progressive life. Otherwise, both the materialistic way of life without any information of God or the demigods and the life engaged in the worship of demigods in pursuit of temporary material enjoyments are different phases of phantasmagoria. They are nicely explained in the Bhagavad Gita also, but the Bhagavad Gita can be understood in the association of pure devotees only, and not by the interpretations of politicians or dry philosophical speculators. Dandakesh, can you read the verse again? I'll put it up. 11. Read this verse again. That was part of the purport. It just came in different slides because I'm trying to make it so everyone can see them. Oh, okay. So this verse, if you read the verse again, it will clarify what we were just reading. Okay. All the different kinds of worshippers of multi demigods can attain the highest perfectional benediction, which is spontaneous attraction and flinching and flinchingly fixed upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead, only by the association of the pure devotee of the Lord. Thank you. Could, could you say something about how that relates to the other big, huge verses that we read about trying to fulfill our material desires in this world? Well, obviously it is, it is not going to uh, give you the highest professional benediction, uh, having to worship demigods for material desires. So most people will want the highest perfection benediction. That's true, but sometimes they will think 
that fulfilling their material desires will be. So this association with a pure devotee is, is uh, something that will help us to understand our highest benefit. Mambatara, can you read? And then Narayan? Transcendental knowledge in relation with the Supreme Lord Hari is knowledge resulting in the complete suspension of the waves of, and whirlpools of the material modes. Such knowledge is self-satisfying due to its being free from material attachment and being transcendental it is approved by authorities. Who could fail to be attracted? 158, Pastor. Yeah, it's not showing up. For so this postal code K4 that you have, R it's for the PO box. 1C7. Please mute. Seven. Somebody's, somebody's got all kinds of sound coming in there. According to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, text 9, the characteristics of pure devotees are wonderful. The complete functional activities of a pure devotee is always engaged in the service of the Lord. And thus the pure devotees exchange feelings of ecstasy between themselves and relish transcendental bliss. This transcendental bliss is experienced even in the stage of devotional practice. Sadhana Aswasta. Aswasta. Properly <laughs> undertaken under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. And in a mature state, the developed transcendentalist, the, the developed transcendental feeling culminates in realization of a particular relationship with the Lord, uh, which a living entity is originally constituted up to the relationship of conjugal love with the Lord, which is estimated to be the highest transcendental bliss. This bhakti yoga being the only means of God realization is called Kaivalya. Thank you. Kaivalya means the Supreme Personality of Godhead, actually. Um, who's next? Narayan? Thank you. That was very profound. Prabhupada is putting the whole philosophy in everything that he says. Go on, Narayan. Oh, okay. Srila Jiva Goswami quotes the Vedic version. In, in this connection, in this connection, and establishes that Narayana, the personality of Godhead, is known as Kaivalya, and the means which enables one to approach the Lord is called the Kaivalya Panta, or the only means of attainment of Godhead. The Kaivalya Panta begins from Shravana or hearing those topics that relate to the supreme to the personality of Godhead and the natural consequence of hearing such Harikatha is attained is is attainment of transcendental knowledge, which cause detachment from all mundane topics, for which a devotee can has no taste at all. For a devotee, all mundane activities, social and political, become unattractive. And in the mature state, such a devotee becomes uninterested, even in his own body, and what to speak of bodily relatives. In such a state of affairs, one is not agitated by the waves of the material modes. This state of affairs is described herein as Pratin Vrata Gunurmi, and it is possible by Atma Prasada or complete self satisfaction without any material connection. The first class devotee of the Lord attains this stage by devotional service, but despite his loftiness for the Lord's satisfaction, he may play the voluntary part of a preacher of the Lord glory, of the Lord's glory and dovetail all into devotional service. Even mundane interests, just to give the neophyte a chance to transform mundane interests into transcendental bliss. Srila 
Rupa Goswami has described this action of a pure devotee as Nirbanda Krish, Krishna Sambandi Yuktam Vairagyam Akuta. Even mundane activities, though failed with service to the Lord, are also calculated to be transcendental or approved Kaivalya affairs. Thank you, Narayan. Madhurya Leela, could you read? And then Colin? Yes, certainly. Well, after Madhurya Leela, Colin. Okay, all right. Sounds good. <laughs> but thank you, but thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> Madhurya, are you there? No, she left. She left. Mm. Okay, Colin, you're on. I'll have to okay. come back in a minute. All right. Charnaka said, the son of Vasudeva, Shula Sukadeva Goswami, was a highly learned sage and was able to describe things in a poetic manner. What did Maharaja Pariksit again inquire from him after hearing all that he had said? Purport. A pure devotee of the Lord automatically develops all godly qualities. And some of the prominent features of these qualities are as follows. He is kind, peaceful, truthful, equable, faultless, magnanimous, mild, clean, non-possessive, a world wisher to all, satisfied, surrendered to Krishna, without hankering, simple, fixed, self-controlled, a balanced eater, sane, mannerly, proudless, grave, sympathetic, friendly, poetic, expert, and silent. Out of these 26 prominent features of a devotee, as described by Krishna, Krishna Dasa Kaviraja in his Chaitanya Charita Meter, the qualification of being poetic is especially mentioned herein in relation to Sukadeva Goswami. The presentation of Srimad Bhagavatam by his recitation is the highest poetic contribution. He was a self realized learned sage. In other words, he was a poet amongst the sages. Uh, we should all take note here that the narration has changed uh, over to Shonaka. We're back now in Namasharanya. Just one okay. point until the end of the chapter. Thank you, uh, Prabhu. Colin. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Isi. Isi Prabhuji. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sulaksana, could you read? And then uh, Gopapatni, and then Faye. Okay. Um, uh, uh, two, uh, Canto 2, 3, 14. O oh, learned Sutta Goswami, please continue to explain such topics to us because we are all eager to hear. Besides that, topics which result in the discussion of the Lord Hari should certainly be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Purport. As we have already quoted from above from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu of Rupa Goswami, even mundane things, if doubted in the service of the of the Lord Sri, Lord Sri Krishna, are accepted as transcendental. The less intelligent do not accept Mahabharata as part of the Vedas, but greater sages and authorities accept it as the fifth division of the Vedas. Bhagavad Gita is also part of the Mahabharata, and it is full of, full of the Lord's instructions for the less intelligent class of men. Some less intelligent men say that Bhagavad Gita is not meant for householders, but such foolish men forget that Bhagavad Gita was explained to Arjun, a grahastha family man, and spoken by the Lord in his role as a grahastha. So Bhagavad Gita, although containing the hyper philosophy of the Vedic wisdom, is for the beginners in the transcendental science. And Srimad Bhagavatam is for graduates and postgraduates in the transcendental science. Therefore, literatures like Mahabharata, the Pura Puranas, and similar other literatures which are full of the pastimes of the Lord are all transcendental literatures and they should be discussed with full confidence 
in the society of great devotees. So I, I, I continue. Uh, well, um, do we have a lot more? Yeah, oh, you can continue. But before you do, we see again how doing everything for Krishna, this is the whole process here is being explained that if we, we Prabhupada just said, you don't have to change your life. Just add Krishna to your life according to religious principles, of course. But by adding Krishna to our lives and doing everything for his satisfaction, that's the way to achieve perfection. That's how we actually will be happy. So I also, I also had a comment to according uh, for the worshiper, worshipers of the demigod. They when they worship demigod, their desires are fulfilled, but at the same time, their desires do not subside. Their desires still continue. And right. whereas when you worship the uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead, he purifies us, and that is the difference. But after worshiping demigod, many, many, many birds, maybe then they will come to worship Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, good Very point. Good. Thank you. So, um, Faye, Catherine, would you like to read? And then go for Patni and Madhuri Leela if she's back. Continued. The difficulty is that such literatures, when discussed by professional men, appear to be mundane literature like histories or epics because there are so many historical facts and figures. It is said here, therefore, that such literature should be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Unless they are discussed by devotees, such literatures cannot be relished by the higher class of men. So the conclusion is that the Lord is not impersonal in the ultimate issue. He is the Supreme Person and he has his different activities. He is the leader of all living entities and he descends at his will and by his personal energy to reclaim fallen souls. Thus he plays exactly like the social, political or religious leaders. Because such roles ultimately culminate in the discussion of topics of the Lord, all such preliminary topics are also transcendental. That is a way of spiritualizing the civic activities of human society. Men have inclinations for studying history and many other mundane literatures, stories, fiction, dramas, magazines, newspapers, etc. So let them be dovetailed with the transcendental service of the Lord, and all of them will turn to the topics relished by all devotees. Wonderful. And those topics are eternal, as opposed to the mundane topics, which are temporary, which has been mentioned by many before. Um, Madhuri so go, is not here. Huh? Madhuri Leela is Oh, she, she left. Okay. Gopapatni, are you here? I don't know if she's here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, she's here. Could you read, please? Here. Yes. Uh, 2315. Maharaj Pariksit, the grandson of the Pandavas, was from his very childhood a great devotee of the Lord. Even while playing with dolls, he used to worship Lord Krishna by imitating the worship of the family deity. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. From the very beginning of his childhood, he had the chance to know intimately the devotional service of Lord Krishna in his own family. The Pandavas, all being devotees of the Lord, certainly venerated family deities in the royal palace for worship. Children who appear in such families fortunately, generally, imitate such worship of the deities. Even in the way of childhood play, by the grace of Lord Sri Krishna, we had the chance of being born in a Vaishnava family. And in our childhood, we imitated the worship of Lord Krishna by imitating our father. Our father encouraged us in all respects to observe all functions, such as the Rathiatra and Dola Yatra ceremonies. 
And he used to spend money liberally for distributing prashad to us children and our friends. Our spiritual master, who also took his birth in a Vaishnava family, got all inspirations from his great Vaishnava father, Chakura Bhaktivinod. That is the way of all lucky Vaishnava families. The celebrated Mirabai was a staunch devotee of Lord Krishna as the great lifter of Govardhan Hill. Did you tell, yeah, what Stoliatra is going to ask you I just wanted to point this one thing out, right. Um, Dola means swing. Uh, We're used to hearing about the Julan Yatra, the swing festival, usually around Janmastami time in the late summer. Um, But this Dola Yatra festival in Jagannath Puri, the Jagannath deity, the uh, Utsav deity comes out and goes to a swing. nearby, near the temple. So that's Doleyatra. It's also held on the same day as Gorponim, that full moon. So Doleyatra is also a festival that Srila Prabhupada says that he did as a child. Vaishnavi, you want to read? I have a question. Yes. Yes, we have a question. Uh, why would Prabhupada mention Mirabai? Um, she, he's never mentioned her before or since, as far as I know, and she, we don't really talk about it. Like, what's the connection? Oh, he, she, he, he respects that he, she was a great devotee. She, she, I think I've heard her speak, him speak about, I can't give the, the quotes. Maitreya, do you know? Uh, in the Chaitanya Charnamrita, there's sprinkles of mentions of her throughout, if memory serves. And he oh, okay. simply mentions that she liked to sing songs about Krishna particularly, and that's about as much as I know. I think her, her, her story is famous because as a child, she worshiped Krishna. Oh, and okay. when, she, when she was married, her um, request to her new husband in order to go along with the marriage was that she could bring her deity with her. And, she, and he agreed and she set up the temple of Krishna in her new house. So that famous example is what's being kind of alluded to here, that even as a child, uh, a a child develops that affection for the deity, then that will last throughout life. Thank you. Madhurya Leela also, it's too bad she left. Are you here, Madhurya? I'm here, but I I can't read. Oh, okay. But I was going to say that your um, forum entry was the perfect description of the all-pervasive deity worship. It was really, I really liked reading that. Thank you. Okay, Vaishnavi, how about you reading now? Okay. The, the life history of many such devotees is almost the same because there is always symmetry between the early lives of all great devotees of the Lord. According to Jiva Goswami, Maharaja Parikshit must have heard about the childhood pastimes of Lord Krishna at Vrindavan, for he used to imitate the pastimes with his young playmates. According to Sridhar Swami, Maharaj Parikshit used to imitate the worship of the family deity by elderly no. Bhadra Prabhu, can you mute yourself? No. Bhadra Prabhu, mute. Um, okay, so... Srila Viswanath Chakrabarti also confirms. Uh, Srila Viswanath Chakrabarti also confirms the viewpoint of Jiva Goswami. So accepting either of them, Maharaj Parikshit was naturally inclined to Lord Krishna from his very childhood. He might have imitated either of the above mentioned activities and all of them establish his great devotion from his very childhood, a symptom of a Mahabhagavata. Such Mahabhagavatas are called Nitya Siddhas or souls liberated from birth. But there are also others. Um, Sorry. But there are also others who may not be liberated from birth, but who develop a tendency for devotional service by association. And they are called Sadhana Siddhas. There is no difference between the two in, in the ultimate issue. And so the conclusion is that everyone can become sadhana siddha, a devotee of the Lord, simply by association with the pure devotees. The concrete example in our great spiritual master, 
Sri Narada Muni. I mean, the concrete example is our great spiritual master, Sri Narada Muni. In our previous life, he was, in his previous life, he was simply a boy of a maidservant. But through association with great devotees, he became a devotee of the Lord of his own standard, unique in the history of devotional service. Thank you. Ikadasi, do you want to read next? I'm trying to go through the whole thing. There you go. Are you there, Akadasi? Oh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, Shukadev Goswami, the son of Vyasadev, was also full in transcendental knowledge and was a great devotee of Lord Krishna, son of Vasudev. So there must have been discussion of Lord Krishna, who is glorified by great philosophers and in the company of great devotees. Purport. The word satam is very important in this verse. Satam means the pure devotees who have no other desire than to serve the Lord. Only in the association of such devotees are the transcendental glories of Lord Krishna properly discussed. It is said by the Lord that his topics are all full of spiritual significance. And once one properly hears about him in the association of the Satam, certainly one senses the great potency and so automatically attains to the devotional stage of life. Maharaj Parikshit and Shukadev Goswami might seem to be opposites, but basically they were both unalloyed, pure devotees of the Lord. When such devotees are assembled together, there can be no topics save discussions of the glories of the Lord or bhakti yoga. In the Bhagavad Gita also, when there were talks between the Lord and his devotee Arjuna, there could not be any topic other than bhakti yoga. However, the mundane scholars may speculate on it in their own ways. Okay, so um, we have two more verses left. Um, so Pritam, and then, then after that, we'll ask if anyone has any questions. So Pritam, can you read? And yes. then Karna? Text, text 17, both by rising and by setting, the sun decreases the duration of life of everyone, except one who utilizes the time by discussing topics of the all good personality of Godhead, purport. This verse indirectly confirms the greater importance of utilizing the human form of life to realize our lost relationship with the Supreme Lord by acceleration of devotional service. Time and tide wait for no man. So the time indicated by the sunrise and the sunset will be uselessly wasted if such time is not properly utilized for realizing identification of spiritual values. Even a fraction of the duration of life wasted cannot be compensated by any amount of gold. Human life is simply awarded to a living entity, Jiva, so that he can realize his spiritual identity and his permanent source of happiness. Thank you. Uh, Karna, but before you do, these verses that we're going to read, that the one that you just read, Pritam, this one and, and others that we'll be reading next week are very famous basic uh, 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 verses that Prabhupada quoted often and spoke about. So they're very familiar to the old devotees and they should become familiar to all of us. Karna? Okay. Do the trees not live? Do the bells of the blacksmith not breathe? All around us, do the beasts not eat and discharge semen? Purport. The materialistic man of the modern age will argue that life or part of it is never meant for discussion of theosophical or theological arguments. Life is meant for the maximum duration of existence for eating, drinking, sexual intercourse, making merry, and enjoying life. The modern man wants to live forever by the advancement of material science, and there are many foolish theories for prolonging life to the maximum duration. But the Shuan Babajtam affirms that life is not meant for so-called economic development or advancement of materialistic science, for the hedonistic philosophy of eating, mating, drinking, and merrymaking. Life is solely meant for tapasya, for purifying existence, 
so that one may enter into eternal life just after the end of the human form of life. So basically, if we want the truth, we read Prabhupada's purports. <laughs> he is uncompromising. So, Pati, if there's something you would like to say, um, and then if anyone has something to say or a question they'd like to ask. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, my, my realization of all, all these different topics is that um, uh, the, the discussion is, uh, as, as Samapriya pointed out so nicely, it's, it's juxtapositioning the two options, trying to enjoy this material world in whatever way one may squeeze it, or understand the, the, the ultimate goal. And again, back to my original um, talk about this chapter, the change in heart. The change in heart is that one gives up that desire to enjoy this material world and actually transforms the desire to serve and please the Supreme Lord. It's, 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 a, it's a heavy task because obviously we're here in this material world, which is symptomatic of our desire. So this, the, the, these verses and this hearing and this whole process, association with a pure devotee brings that change about. So I, I feel very uh, fortunate to come in contact with all of you who are also on this same path. And by, by doing this regularly, um, it has like a compounding effect. If you, have, if you have some money in the bank and then you get interest on that, then the next time you get more interest on the accumulated um, uh, amount. And the next time that the interest comes, you get even more because you're, you're including that interest. So in the same way, this process of hearing systematically, um, it says that in the heart, it has that compounding effect. It grows. And then what you've already learned, it grows more. And it becomes like a whole network of realizations and, and actually does change the heart, change the desire of the living entity. Anyone also, else? Uh, uh, one thing, this discussing amongst the bodies, um, I think I'm, I'm very lucky because my husband and I, we, we talk about these topics all the time and it's very enriching uh, and very important. So, you know, we're trying to make a situation so that we can uh, share this with other sincere devotees, which you all are. So anyone else have something to say? Ian, I see you just came, or maybe I didn't see you before. Would you like to say something or anyone have a question? Here's Vajra. Okay, first we'll have Ian. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I just, um, just we were thinking about uh, the aspect of being exposed to deity worship from an early age. Uh, most of us, when we were growing up, we went to church. So the whole concept of worshiping God was there. And also, in Christmas time, we celebrate a lot of dogs. We call them dollies in Jamaica. So I'm thinking that, you know, worshiping those dolls and you knowing that you're worshiping the Supreme Lord is kind of enlightening. And then that we go to, you know, if we want to, you know, as like. I couldn't really understand what you were saying. Worshiping. You know, we got dollies at Christmas time. The girls mainly. We call them dollies in Jamaica. You guys can call them dolls. Are you hearing me? I think so, yeah. Does anyone have some answer for that? Worshipping Durga is worshipping a demigod, but this will prepare us for worshipping Krishna. We have to recognize also these demigods, are, they're not ordinary people. They do deserve our respect. You know, they're in charge of the universe and uh, with great responsibility, and they're all devotees. So if we should deal with them as Vaishnav, as we deal with Lord Shiva, Vaishnav and um, Yata Shambhu, he's the greatest devotee. So, but, but, but we must worship Krishna because by worshiping Krishna, Akama Savakama Va, we get everything that is needed. Anyone, Padra, can you speak? Thank you, Ian. Yeah, Hare Krishna, thank you. Uh... In the text uh, 12, Srila Prabhupada writing purport, and it is not good news to hear that 
He says this transcendent bliss is experienced even in the stage of devotional service, in sadhana bhakti. So I'm a sadhak. But uh, why this, uh, why this um, transcendent bliss doesn't say, stay all the time? What are some of the, can some, can someone can share some light why this transcendent bliss doesn't stay all the time? Because it's like come and go, come and go, come and go. Well, one thing would be that when our devotional service is steady, when we're thinking of, to the extent, it's there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita 4.11. Um, as they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we are absorbed in Krishna, to that extent, we won't forget him. What, what do you think, Pati? I think that just like um, ecstasy uh, ha has, has different expressions. Um, obviously, even in the lives of pure devotees, you look at the lives of the Acharyas. Um, it doesn't appear like they're in constant ecstasy, but we just came across a, a, a pastime. We heard about a devotee who was in India and he went to Srila Prabhupada, or he wrote to Prabhupada and he said, this is very difficult for me. It's, it's too much of a different culture. The people are very different. It's, uh, I'm not used to the diet, whatever, the, the weather, whatever it was. He said, it's very difficult. I want, I want to change my location. But Sama, you, can't, you heard this one. Where, where did it come from? Was it a letter or somebody? Actually, you it? told me it. <laughs> you told it to me. No, you but, told it to me. Oh, but anyway, well. Prabhupada told him that because I see Krishna everywhere, wherever I go, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the uh, same thing when he was in... One of the temples, somebody said, oh, don't you miss Vrindavan? He said, I'm in Vrindavan. Right. And he was in New York, physically. Nanda, do you have something to add? Thank you. Nanda Ji, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, but I don't have anything to add right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think we're going to wind up then. Thank you, everyone.